All right. Um, so I'll just pray a little bit more. Um, Father, I just thank you. Um, I felt like what he was saying this last song was, um, it is, it's actually his air that we breathe and it's all the oxygen around us. It doesn't belong to any other God and it certainly doesn't belong to us, um, that it belongs to him and, um, and he's so free with us. Like it just was taking breaths and like in and out and in and out and just trusting that it's going to be there. So Father, I pray um, we would see how we can trust you um, as our, our maker and our sustainer today. Um, God, I just I bind uh, confusion in the room and I just pr uh, pray you would release clarity, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right. So I... Um, I've been thinking a lot about statues being torn down because we've been having, uh, you know, all of these riots that are kind of quiet right now. But a few weeks ago, uh, what, a month ago, it was a lot of talk on social media about um, we got a break from COVID for a little while. And then it was like riots and a lot of people tearing down statues. And so I've been talking a lot to the Lord about um, how he feels about that. And uh, you guys have seen this, right? You all know this is happening. Um, not just in the United States, all over the world, people, um, uh, protesters coming. Usually it's, uh, it seems like it's not governments agreeing and taking them down. It is often even just um, like crowds of people who are like, we're done with this and we're not going to wait anymore for the people in authority to say that they're done. Like we're just going to do it or defacing um, statues, um, statues of Confederate soldiers, of people. Um, a lot, I saw a lot in Europe of people who were um, slave traders, um, people tearing down statues. My very favorite though was there's a famous statue of the Little Mermaid and I feel like you would know stuff. I was looking for Dave, but um, Denmark maybe. It's like by the ocean and it's famous. And somebody spray painted racist mermaid on it. And then, so, you know, I felt like that was a little comical relief in the middle of all of this. But people are really, really angry about this. So I've been asking the Lord a lot about uh, just how he feels about it and what he sees as he w is watching this happen in the earth. And... Um, and so thinking a lot, this is really reflective. Hold on. It was like right in my eyeball. It was like a mirror. Um, a lot about idols, um, statues, and um, when you read the Old Testament, statues, like idols, I, you know, I think of like the golden calf or something like that. It's very difficult to connect with for us, I think, because like how many of you bow down to statues and worship them? None of us, right? So we're like, whew, no idolatry in this room. Um, JK, there is. Um, so idols represent false gods, right? And I'll just tell you, this book is so full of this topic. I'm just going to tell you a couple of things that the Lord's been telling me. Um, we could talk for weeks about this and not exhaust what the word has to say about it, even the main and plain of what the word is saying about it. Um, so these are just some of my thoughts about it. But idols to me, when I think about them, I would think there are there would be idols to um, you would worship the very the things that would you thought were giving you the very basics of life, food, water, like that means fertility, right? Your crops are going to grow. Your cows are going to have more baby cows and your sheep are going to have more baby sheep. And, um, you're going to, so you're going to be able to eat. Um, the rain is going to fall because you need that for food. I mean, the very basics of what we need, right? Safety is another, um, very basic. So war gods of war, um, all the basics. And then kind of after that are kind of our secondary needs of like being seen. Things are beautiful. Like we, we worship different things, but at the forefront are the things that are going to give us what we absolutely need, like our health, food, safety, fertility. We worship what makes us feel like we are on the winning side of that because we all want to be on the side that's going forward and, and provides us security. Um, and it's all about increase. We're always looking for security because secure, like, I know I'll be able to feed my kids when we get home from church and feed them dinner. And as far as I can tell, my history says I'm be able to feed my kids. If I did not think that I could feed my kids when I got home, I would be very distracted right now because I would be worried about what I'm going to feed my people. And not like, I don't know what drive through I'm going to go through. The anxiety of not being able to feed yourself is distracting. Um, we know 
from our friends who live in other countries. Um, they can't go to school and focus at school because they're hungry and they're thinking about food. Um, and so we worship what will give us security and that turns into like ease and comfort and a relaxing. Um, and what I felt like the Lord was saying is that the root of most worship, what we worship is relief from anxiety. And that's really important to us. So this is like the first thing that he said to me where I was like, okay, this starts to connect to me because the bowing down to statues doesn't mean that much to me. Nobody wants to feel afraid. It's actually really bad for us to feel afraid for a long time. It can cause brain damage when you live under a lot of anxiety and fear. It's not good for you. I think we've probably all known people who have been in situations where they've grown up with a ton of anxiety and fear all the time. You don't act like you would if you were able to relax. Oh, it's really raining. Um, Okay, so let's first go to um, Exodus 20 because I want to read into the record what the Lord said in the beginning about this. Oh, I printed some of my verses. Exodus 20, verses 3 through 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image like any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So God is actually super clear. It's funny within the last week I've had uh, conversations with, I think like Dave said it to me and then Barbara said it to me we're not supposed to have graven Im images just talking about that. And I was like, we're not supposed to have graven images. That's actually pretty clear in the word. Um, we do make a lot of excuses why statues are great and they're important to us. They're not like, they're not good for us. Um, and I'll talk about that more in just a little bit. So the Lord is pretty clear. Like, one God, I'm it. And it was very awkward for Moses as he's walking down the mountain with these tablets that say this, uh, and <laughs> look what they're doing. Um, they're worshiping a baby cow made out of gold. Um, I remember recently, I felt like I, I saw probably just on the internet or maybe in somebody else's Bible, it had a picture, like an artist rendering of the golden calf. And I was like, that was it. It was really small. And it was just an artist rendering. But I thought, that's what they decide. Like, that was their thing. All right. So actually reading what, um, what happened there is really important. So let's flip over to Exodus 32. It's 32 verses 1 through 6. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come, make us gods that shall go before us. For at for as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, I like how they said that, this Moses, whoever he is, we do not know what has become of him. So right there, they're not starving. They are not like, we want to wait for him and we can't, like, there's no enemy army coming towards them. They're not like, nothing is happening except they're, they don't know what is coming next and they don't know what to do. And they're worried. I mean, they're probably just like, we can't. We can't send anybody up to go find him. Where would we even look? And it's probably dangerous because I think God's up there. He's probably dead. Like, we need something that is going to lead us. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and, make a mold and made a molten calf. Then they said, this is our God, O Israel. And that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Um, so you can just see like all of the idol worship that they had for generations uh, been a part of in Egypt. Um, it's just like, they're just stirring. <laughs> it's like a salad. Um, so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose up early the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Um, they seamlessly went right into it, right? So they, they were having a hard time. God really, the reason he made his commandments so clear is because they needed really clear words about what it was like to worship this God because they did not know. Um, and they were having a feast to the Lord and there's a golden cow and he's going to lead them. And then Moses comes down and um, I felt what the Lord, um, one of the really 
maybe the only really strong warning that I got this whole message was this, um, that the Lord is saying to us that not knowing what will happen next creates major anxiety for us. We get very antsy and that it will lead us into idol worship if we're not careful. He said, he said a holding pattern, and, and this is for us, a holding pattern will lead us into idol worship if we are not careful. He said to beware the doldrums, and the doldrums are when you're out on the ocean and the wind stops blowing and your ship is just sitting there and you don't know when the wind is going to start blowing again and you don't know if you'll run out of water. You're like, you're just worried and you have no control over anything. You just have to wait for the wind. And the Lord says, wait for the wind. And if the and if the people of Israel had had a vision for worshiping God, spending their time doing that, see, they had been under so much oppression and so much work where they came from. They came out and all of a sudden they don't have to even worry about what they're going to eat. It was boring what they were eating, but they didn't have to work for it. And they had all of this time that they could have devoted to worship for, to God and, and they had no vision for it. So I feel like the Lord is saying like, we need to have a vision for how to spend our time. And if we feel like we're bored when we're here, um, we really need to talk to him about that because he is desiring that we spend more and more time doing this thing, having a vision for spending our time worshiping the Lord. Okay. That's what he said about that. And then I wrote that they mixed the golden calf with a feast to the Lord and couldn't tell that that was crazy town. That was nuts. Um, let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. This is uh, 1 through 14. Um, I love this passage. It was really good. This whole chapter, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I, you might want to. It's really good. It talks about the blessings of obeying God and then a very long discourse on um, the curses of disobedience. And the curses are, um, I think they're important. So um, here are the promises. So just keep in mind as I read this list, what we talked about. We're going to worship what's going to feed us, what's going to get our crops to grow, going to take care of our cows. We're going to have more kids. Our kids are going to be safe. And, and, and we're going to have purpose and we're going to go forward. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I've commanded you today, that the Lord, your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. You'll be victorious. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and produce of your ground and the increase of your herds and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you when you come in and blessed shall you, shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemy who enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. That's where all this time comes in. Because if you're a holy people unto the Lord, you're going to spend time. Not you're going to toil less, right? He's blessing all these things so that so that you have more time to come in and worship him. Um, just he's sworn to you, if you keep the commandment of the Lord your God and walk in all his ways, then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods. So people are going to quit picking on you because they're scared of you. Um, in the fruit of your body and in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of, of the ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to you, to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give you the rain in your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above, above only and not be beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, that you are careful to observe them. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to be to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. And what does that sound like? Don't go to the right. Don't go to the left. It's almost like a narrow road. Um, and spoiler alert, they could not do this because you need the Holy Spirit to be on a narrow road. And the whole Old Testament is full of a lot of blood <laughs> that proves we could not do this. Um, a lot of heartache. Um, and... There is nothing, so when I think of pagan gods and what they were bowing down to and worshiping, gods of war, of, 
you know, things that were scary, like the ocean, they would make gods of the ocean because somebody's got to be in charge of that. It's terrifying, but we're only out there so we can either trade or find food or, uh, you know, crops and fertility, all of those things. Everything is covered here. It's very comprehensive. You need one God. I'm invisible. I don't want you to make statues to me. I want you to know that I am real because you experience me. And then you just, you make the choice to remember me. And he says, don't go to the right. Don't go to the left. Don't serve other gods. And uh, verse 13, it says, he would make us the head and not the tail. Um, I feel like that verse is really misused in the church. Like you need to be careful. Like you're just not automatically the head and not the tail, but that is very, um, that is the desire in every man's heart is to not be the tail. Nobody wants to be the tail. And we claim that we grab a hold of it, but like there are a lot of conditions to this, that you're obeying the Lord and you're following him. Um, the curses, Dun, dun, dun. And the whole rest is like a ton of the curses. Um, one thing I really noticed in the curses, I was, because health was one of the things that I thought, like I would worship, especially maybe it's because COVID is here. Oh, I would worship whatever makes me healthy. It's not on this list of the blessings, but the opposite is surely in here. I wrote that down, verse 58. If you do not, this is verse 58. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Like, and then it just keeps going on and on about all these sicknesses. Um, I felt like that was important to pass out. And then verse 62 and verse 63. You shall be left few in number. Whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God, and it shall be that you that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you um, you go to possess. So this is a narrow road. The whole. The whole Old Testament is proof that nobody can stay on this narrow road, and it's full of talk about idolatry. Um, we can't clean ourselves up from the outside, I think, is what it's showing. Um, and we know that in theory, but the way that I try to keep my kids from evil is kind of proof that I think that I can whitewash my environment enough to keep them safe from from false gods and from idolatry. Um, but the whole Old Testament, I mean, think of Noah's flood. God got rid of everybody, almost everybody. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Saul having to kill all the um, Amalekites. Um, I was thinking of, of how many times uh, Israel would go and like intermingle, like try to integrate with um, people from other lands, like all of this idolatry. It just kept getting in there. And we can never kind of be clean enough. And we still have like really strict sects of religious people in the world, not just Christians, but some Christians um, that try to, we're going to stay away from everybody. And, but God, I mean, he looked at the Pharisees and he just said, he called them whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, you're dead on the inside and cups that are filthy on the inside, but they're clean on the outside. Um, But we're all made to worship. Every person, there's how many people did you say? Eight billion? There's almost eight billion people. They were every single person is made to worship. Very, very few people worship God in spirit and truth, but all men worship. Like everybody's worshiping all the time. Um, so if people tell you that they don't worship any God, they do. And what God is left when it, you're not saying it's Yahweh, if you're not saying it's Allah, if you're not saying it's Buddha, give you a clue. Um, and we actually all, we, some of us might think that we don't worship ourselves, but we all worship ourselves in the end. All nations are supposed to be blessed by Israel, but instead they committed adultery. Um, so let's go to Ezekiel 16. Mm -hmm. I think I put a... I had to put little tabs in my Bible or else I would take forever. This is verse 15, um, Ezekiel 16. I'm sorry, what? 
It's Ezekiel 16, verse 15 through 34. But you trusted in your own beauty. You played the harlot because of your fame and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have you. You took some of your garments and, and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played the harlot on them. Such things should not be nor should not happen nor be. You have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. You took your embroidered garments and you covered them and you set my oil and my incense before them. Also my food, which I gave you, the pastry of fine flour and oil and honey, which I fed you. You set it before them as sweet incense. And so it was, says the Lord God. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. This is, it's harlotry is talking about idolatry. It's like they're interchangeable. Were you, were your acts of harlotry a small matter that you have slain my children and offered them up? Offered to them by causing them to pass through the fire. And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and struggling in your blood. Then it was also after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, says the Lord God, that you also built for yourself a shrine and you made a high place for yourself in every street. You built your high places at the head of every road and you made your beauty to be abhorred. That's what happens when you worship your own, when you get enamored with your own beauty. It causes, eventually everyone around you abhors what was beautiful, what was genuinely beautiful. But that ver first verse in this, it says, you trusted in your own beauty. You offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your act of harlotry. You also committed har harlotry with the Egyptians, your very fleshy neighbors, and increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you, diminished your allotment, and gave you up to the will of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor, Chaldea, and even then you were not satisfied. How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the deed of a brazen harlot. And here's the really hard part. You erected your shrine at the head of every road and you built your high place in every street. Yet you're not like other harlots because you scorned payment. You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of your husband. Men make payments to harlots, but you made your payments to all your lovers and you hired them to come to you from all around for your harlotry. You were the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot. In that you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you are the opposite. So God is saying, not only, not only are you engaged in the worship of false gods around you, you actually are, you're, you're so bad, you're actually polluting, right? Have you guys like ever had, um, I, feel, I feel like my mom had some times like this because she had more kids than I do, but you, you have the good kid and you don't want them to hang out with the bad kids. And then the real story comes out because they have been hanging around with the bad kids, but your kid is actually the even badder kid and they're doing the naughty stuff and they're getting the bad kid into trouble. And it's like, oh, you found out your kid is the bad kid. Um, I, and that's what like God is saying, like you guys, you're supposed to, you were supposed to be uh, like the stars in the sky, numerous and bless every nation. But because of your harlotry, because you can't stay faithful to me, uh, you're getting other people into even more trouble, not getting them out of any of it. And we know that we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do any of that. Like we needed Jesus. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, the situation um, with in the Old Testament about what was going on with Israel. So I wanted to talk about us though. Um, we live in a culture that we call the West, right? Western world. Um, and, and most of the world is Western by this point, or at least touched by it. And, and the West is a combination of, um, uh, somebody made a video that was helpful. It, he said it's two cities, Jerusalem and Athens. So the West is a, a, a mixture of, uh, Judeo-Christian tradition and values. So, uh, monotheism, only one God. And, and in that comes a lot of, um, exclusion. We have exclusion in marriage and um, a lot of uh, talk of faithfulness. The idea that God is no respecter of 
persons. These were just a couple of things that um, came to my mind. And so that comes um, equality, all, all men are created equal, comes, that's a Judeo-Christian value. Um, and then Athens is, sorry, I just smacked myself in the face. Ath Athens, um, so the Greeks, and that speaks of like philosophy, logic, um, this idea that you could argue and get closer to truth because there were some parameters of what is logical and what is not. Um, democracy is the gift of Greece, right, to the whole world we, um, that we live underneath. Um, so I think of like Socrates and Aristotle and Socrates was uh, very famous for he would just have he would just have open forums and people would talk. Annie and I were talking about this, the Socratic method um, of lines of questioning. And it was you would ask a question, and from that it was like you ask another question. There was never en there was endless questions to try to think about things deeper. <clears throat> um, so that became kind of common people having the chance to be with other people and think deeper thoughts. And how can we as a society go forward um, and asking a lot of questions, which really is a counterfeit of um, one thing I ask, one thing I desire is to, to dwell in your courts forever, to gaze upon your beauty and what? Inquire the Lord in his temple. So um, instead of inquiring of the Lord in his temple, it was inquiring of, it was inquiring in the temple of humanity which is, I mean, it'll get you somewhere. I mean, obviously it got the Greeks somewhere, but it wasn't necessarily where God would have led them if they had inquired of the Lord. But their gods are dead. I mean, I'm sure that they, for a very long time, tried to ask their gods questions, but if your gods are dead, you know, right, they're not talking to you. Um, so the Greeks, they have... I, this is really important because if you could take us all on a field trip to um, Jerusalem, you know, go visit King David and, and hang out and be in the culture of what was going on in ancient Israel. And then we hopped over to um, visit Socrates um, in ancient Greece. We would feel more at home in Greece. Our, like, our culture is more Greek than it is. But we because we think we're Christian, we, I think, can get deluded into believing we are more, like, we're more Jewish Christian, but we're not. We're actually uh, we're closer to Greek values in our society in America. So um, Greeks, though, they had a kind of a different relationship with their gods. It was kind of changing as time went on. So, like, if I asked you guys, like, what did Moloch look like? Or what did Baal look like? Do you guys know? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like, I think there's cows involved. Like any any artist rendering I've seen of like Moloch is a giant like kind of cow man kind of combination or um, a lot more images of Egyptian gods and goddesses. So a lot of um, like animals up top, people on the bottom sort of thing mixed. But if I say what does Zeus look like? He looks like he looks like God on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, like doesn't he? He looks like a guy, and we know this because I mean the statue of Zeus in uh, uh, was it a, a, not Athena? It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Like it's very famous. We actually do know what these people thought this God looked like, and so instead of it's, and you can see this morph of um, gods being kind of animal-like, a calf, uh, you know, just like these, these weird things that we see in the Old Testament too, they look like people. And this is an important transition because do you see what we're like, what we're melting towards is who's God? We're God, right? Self-worship. Um, so the Greeks, they have this um, myth about Prometheus. It's just a myth. It's just a story, but he's a, he's a demigod. He's a Titan. He's a demigod. So he's God and a person and he's a hero like we call them heroes like Hercules they're heroes right they're they're not scary um and this was important to them because the gods were so erratic because they weren't real they were just demons and they weren't real and so they were unpredictable 
and they were very erratic. You couldn't figure it out. You could, you were always trying to get on the right side. You could never quite get there because they're not real. And, and they were worshiping demons who love to like just torture people. Right. And so Prometheus goes and he gets fire and he brings it to the Greeks and, and kind of now not their whole fate isn't in the hands of these fake gods. It's in their own hands. And, um, the demigod thing is really important because it's that next step to worshiping ourselves. And this is where G, like a really important distinction of Jesus, um, because many people will, many people who aren't even, um, Christians will worship Jesus as a demigod. They will worship him as, um, a God-like lower G, a God-like man, right? I mean, he's wonderful. He said wonderful things. We like him. He's God-like, but the truth is uh, Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. Um, I feel like I wrote that verse down. I'm going to find that. Hold on. I don't think I did. Um, but that, I, I just, I feel like that's a really important distinction. And, um, and when you hear people say that, uh, Jesus was a good man, that's what they're saying. He was a hero. They're, they're lumping him in with people like Hercules. <laughs> he wasn't, he wasn't, he was not a helper of mankind. He was this, he's the savior of mankind. He's fully God and he's fully man. Um, I wrote so many extra notes. I did write this on here. So it's Matthew 6, 34. I typed some of these out because I was like, I don't want to keep. Um, so, so now, uh, you know, in kind of Greek mythology, they've got fire. They've got some control over their life. Because there's a lot of exhaustion and anxiety in um, courting unpredictable gods and having some control over your environment creates stability for your soul. Yes, Dean. Yeah. That's a really good. <laughs> Dean is saying financially Greece is still in trouble to this day. They still can't get it together. Um, Lord, we pray for Greece that your word would run swiftly and be glorified in that nation, Lord. Um, that you have good plans for them. And you have not forgotten about them, Lord. Um, this is really important because, raise your hand if you feel anxiety. Right. We go into idol worship when we have anxieties that need to be, like, we need the, we need the fire to quit burning so hot. And if we go to anybody but the Lord, we're going to go into idol worship. If any of our answers are, I can't wait long enough for God to answer this, we're going to go into that. And so you can see like having coming out of only relying on gods that aren't even real, aren't really answering you to some kind of control. And so the, um, the, the Greeks called it, they, there was the bad striving, which was um, killing each other to get ahead. Like we want to get ahead, but they recognize probably killing each other is not the best way to get ahead. Um, but competition became the new, the good striving, they called it. Um, because if I make pots, pottery and so does Barbara, I don't have to kill her to get her business. I just have to be better than her. So that's kind of nice to Barbara or me, like whoever's going to be better. Like, at least we're not dead, right? This, that was nice. And so we're going to get, um, we're going to get ahead. Society is going to get ahead. So there's all this worship of people who are innovative, people who are powerful, like if it's in war, whoever's powerful, smart on it, knows what they're doing, we're going to turn them into heroes and worship them. Um, this is really a, a counterfeit of stirring one another up to love and good works, though. Um, competition between brothers and sisters in Christ is not in the Bible at all. <laughs> That's, it's antichrist. Um, and but it seems to work. Dave, you could do that thing. It's hot. Do you mind? Okay, cool. Thank you, sir. Um, 
So we, but we do that. We celebrate the people. So think about who we make statues of in our country. They are people who helped society or were innovative and pulled us forward, who helped us win a war, um, who we, the society has a debt to them because they served them in such a great way that we're going to erect some kind of statue out of uh, like gratitude or whatever. Um, we really want to get on the right side of whatever power we believe has like the goods that are going to move us forward or even just like the basics, keep us fed, keep us safe, all of that stuff. Um, so we have all these different choices. We can choose God. We can choose false gods. We can choose uh, ourselves. Um, other people that we put on pedestals, we can choose to follow them. But our needs aren't fake. Like we actually need to feel safe. We need to be fed, all of those things. Um, so I think that gives me a lot more compassion for people who took off their earrings and made a golden cow out of them because um, they're not that different. Like they're the same as me. I just am a little more uh, modern and polished with my calf making. You know what I mean? It's a lot of it I think I do it internally and and it's less external. Um, okay, I want to go to Ezekiel um, 16, the beginning of this Ezekiel passage. Are we still there? Is that where we were? In the beginning of this Ezekiel passage, this really touched me. I was reading this a couple weeks ago and um, just the love of the Lord um, just came over me in, in a unique way. And because these gods, if you read, have, if you've ever read ancient, like Greek or Roman uh, myths about gods, um, they're nuts, especially if you don't read, don't read the kid versions, read like the real ones. They're awful. They're, they do horrible things. They don't care about humanity at all. And they're just, they're so evil. And, um, but this is like, I love this passage. This is our God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, cause Jerusalem to know our abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water and clen to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And when I passed by you and I saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, and you were naked, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time... Your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and I covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord God. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed you of your blood and I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and I gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with the fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck and I put a jewel in your nose, earrings on your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord. Um, and that next verse is the one that says, but you trusted in your own beauty. But the Lord, um, he is wholly unlike any other God, Com completely unlike any other God. This is how he treats us. He found us when we were naked and going to die, when nobody cared about us, and he clothes us, and he makes us his own. He's, he's going to marry us. Um, and so I just heard the Lord last night. He's like, do you believe that I'm a hard man? That accusation of ever calling God a hard man it just kind of hit home new when I think of these evil gods and these horrible stories of the mythology of other religions. And then I, and then I come contrast it with like this beautiful God who loves us and has redeemed us. And when, when he's saying to us, are you saying I'm a hard man? Like that should really hit home. That's very insulting to him that we ever call him a hard man. Um, you know, all of our souls, our souls long to worship 
That's inside of all of us. So that's why I say everyone in the whole world is worshiping at all times because it's part of who we are. But also what's common to every man, I think, is that our flesh hates to grovel. We hate to be reliant on other people and we hate to have to ask for things. And so when we talk about self-worship, it really, um, it checks all the boxes and it makes it very tidy because you can still worship, but you're not having to grovel or ask anybody for anything. And so it just, that's why it feels so satisfying. And that's why we all fall into it is because it's like this round and round, the, you know, the mulberry bush kind of, um, cycle that we get into. Um, but it's just, it destroys us. In this, um, in our country, we uh, we love heroes. We have we are deeply steeped in hero worship in our country, which is worship of self, right? A better version of self. Um, I look up to this man because he did something someday I would like to do. Or I look up to him because he invented a thing that I really enjoy. It is, it is, it's all worship of self. Um, self-reliance, the American dream. I can do anything. If I put my mind to it, that's what, that's why we love the freedom is because if I, if I work hard and I mean, and this is a lie, if I work hard enough, I can do anything. Say the, and the, the couple of people who have a testimony of working hard and having the one thing that they wanted, sell us the lie that you could work hard enough to have anything, which is not true. Because the person who built a business didn't become an astronaut. And so they didn't accomplish everything and anything there. You know what I mean? Only God. Yeah. Um, so the, the American dream that I can do anything that I put my mind to is it is false. Um, and I wanted to talk about America because a few uh, prophetic words, I felt like Sam maybe sent me one that somebody, none of them were mine or I think anybody here, but there were a few words I had heard come out about the Washington Memorial falling. Um, I think we had a friend who uh, had a dream maybe that um, it was struck by lightning. And, and as I was reading, um, I'm going to go to Daniel 2. How am I doing on time? Okay. I'm going to go to Daniel 2. Um, to talk about um, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, I was reading this story again. I just, I knew, I knew what God wanted me to talk about had something to do with this, um, another famous uh, golden statue in the Bible. And uh, yeah, so let's just read this. I'm going to do chapter two, verses 31 through 35. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream and Daniel gets called to interpret it. Um, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and, it was, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream that he has. And then, let's see, I wanted to skip down just towards the end of 40, verse 44 and 45. And in those days... Uh, and in the days that these kings, the God of heaven, will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. Um, so, you know, kingdoms get left to, you know, they diminish. Somebody else comes in, takes them over. He's saying, this is going to be a kingdom that that won't happen to. Um, it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. Um, and the the Lord was just connecting to me the um, this uh, statue that Nebuchadnezzar ends up making for himself. Um, and the Washington Memorial, I um, just write down here at the beginning of chapter three, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width um, six cubits. And for some reason, just the 
the ratio of that, like the math stuck out, stuck out to me. And, and I thought, I grabbed my phone and I Googled and, and sure enough, the, the, it's the same ratio for the, um, the Washington Memorial is 555 feet tall and 55 feet wide. And um, probably if you study a lot of the um, pagan things that are in Washington, D.C., you would know that. But I didn't know that. It just felt like a cool connection. It felt like it was really from the Lord. Um, and so that's why I wanted to talk about Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. But this is really uh, amazing to me. You know, I think, I always think of the book of Revelation, the revelation that John got is amazing, like to be able to see the future. But I've never thought of that for Nebuchadnezzar before. Like God told him what was going to happen. And, and he was like three good questions away from probably having an amazing encounter with God and maybe living for him because Daniel tells him, uh, tells him the dream and the interpretation and he worships God. I mean, it wasn't exclusive. It was, he, he didn't under, he didn't, he wasn't really getting, this is the only God. And if you want to worship him, it, it's just him. Uh, it's, it's God's way or the highway, but he stirred it in. Um, in my, my, I read some commentary that said um, there were records that Nebuchadnezzar, there was like an uprising uh, about 10 years into his reign. And and so maybe building this statue was his like knee jerk reaction to like, oh, that guy said the, the head, I was a head of gold and it's going to fall. And I didn't think it would be this fast. And, and I didn't think it would, I'm going to build a statue and I'm going to make it really tall because uh, yeah, I'm going to make it really tall. I'm going to put it on, uh, elevate it really high up. So, you know, in order to be 10 times taller than it was wide, it would have to be on a bunch of things um, because men are about 25% tall. I don't know. Anyway, there was a bunch of math involved, so it doesn't really matter. But he could have just been... He, what if he had just asked God, well, what about the stone? What about the kingdom that's never going to end? And like can I get into that business? Like, can I be a part of that? What would have happened? Um, you know, we'll never know. And that's really sad. I, I'm very sad for him that we'll never know. Instead of talking to God, this God that was alive, that had come and told him marvelous things, he really tried to rewrite history and to make it to immortalize himself, to make like, nope, I'm, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the gold from head to toe. And then he tried to make everybody come and uh, worship his own delusion that he had made there. And, um, and so I just see like, I just see anxiety for his future caused him to build a statue and to make a lot of people come and worship it and, and to lead a whole nation into idolatry, like deeper into it. Um, and then the people who wouldn't bow down, they are thrown into a fiery furnace. Um, and I felt like what the Lord was saying that um, it is actually the king's prerogative to destroy what offends. Um, God intervened in um, these boys. So that's um, Daniel 3, 13 through 18. I'm running out of time. Um, we'll go fast. It's just, you guys know the story. It's the story of Nebuchadnezzar and these kids. And they say, um, we don't care what happens like, it really is, you don't have to keep asking us. You just, if you are intent on throwing us in this fire, just throw us in. Um, and I love that, I love that they do not argue with him. They don't try to make any excuses. They're like, get it over with. If you're doing it, do it. We've already made our choice. And they go into this fire. A higher authority saves their life, but they don't try to save their own life. Because it's the king's prerogative to destroy what offends. Um, I feel like that's really important, and it's very offensive to our flesh. I feel like this is what we're talking about, people taking away our things um, to just let it go. Moses did it righteously when he took the golden calf and he threw it in the fire, made them eat it. Um, and so let's go to Matthew 13, um, verse 37. Matthew 13, 37 through 43 says, He answered and he said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at, and the harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all the things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into a 
furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. So the, the Lord is saying, um, if you don't bow down, you probably will get thrown into a fire. Um, but it's like, there's fire on both sides. I mean, there's the fire of hell that is going to last forever. And there is the fire of, that you can see and kind of feel right now. So it feels more real. Um, and the Lord just says, we have to set our mind on being thrown into a fiery furnace. And it is his prerogative, whether he saves us or not. And those, um, Daniel's friends really had a grip on that, 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 I, I don't want to keep talking about it. Our decision is made <laughs> probably a little bit of like, before we lose courage, throw us in. And, and Jesus met them in there and he saved their lives and he can save our life or we can lose it, but we will be with him forever. But it is a, it is the prerogative of the king to burn what offends him and he, and human kings do that as well. Um, and just to be ready for that and to have our hearts set. Um, Matthew 10 27 through 30 says, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak it in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach it on the housetops. Don't feel, fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value, are of more value than many sparrows. Thank you, Lord. Um, just really quickly, like five more minutes, maybe five more minutes. Um, we have a really false idea of our history. Um, and I'm not just picking on the United States. I'm picking on it because everyone in the room is an American citizen. And, and this is our culture that we're growing up in. But um, this is true of, of all nations. We don't remember history the way that God remembers history. And, and it, it's very offensive to us because we feel like if people are pulling down statues, that it is destroying history. Um, and if you pull down a statue and replace it with your version of history, it is all bad. It's like a it's all bad. Um, and, you know, some of the examples, if, Washington, I mean, if you go to Washington, D.C., it's full of idolatry and, and witchcraft, full of it. And I would just say, like, don't bother studying it. What is the point of studying the schemes of the enemy? But it is, um, you know, the Lincoln Memorial, the, the statue of Abraham Lincoln sitting in his chair, and he's giant. It's a temple. The inscription above it says, in this temple, it's a temple, guys, a real temple that people intended for pe the citizens to come and worship. In this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the union, he saved the union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Do you hear what they're saying? God didn't save our union. Abraham Lincoln did. And... We're enshrining him forever, which is ridiculous. I mean, the word forever should never be used apart from God. Nothing is forever. We have to be careful how boastful we are. But listen to this history. Um, this is Mary of Bethany. You don't have to turn here. It's really quick. This is Matthew 26. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always, you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial for her. Do you see the difference between the way that we try to memorialize people? What they do. And this woman who's like, when I picture this, I almost can never see her face. I just see her tears and I see Jesus. When we look at how Israel remembers their history, it's amazing. They don't have any graven images, but they manage to remember their history. And I think this is important. So let's go to Psalm 78. Let's flip the Psalms. Maybe if I can find it. This is Psalm 78, um, verses 1 through 8. 
Give ear, O my people, to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, telling to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Just think about American history that you studied in high school. Was it full of um, the praises of the Lord and his strength and the wonderful works that he's done? For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope on God and not forget the works of God, but to keep his commandments and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. You know, when I'm teaching American history to my kids, is my purpose that they would know God. And he says it right here, that they would not forget the works, that they might set their hope on God. They wouldn't forget the works of God, but they would keep his commandments. Very simple. It is imperative that my kids hope in God, that they don't forget the works of God, and then keep his commandments. That's what they need to know. And this, I mean, this book is like, it seems like so big and it's full of history. It's really not. There's millions of interactions between Israelites all through history that are not in this book. But this was divinely inspired. This is what the Lord said we needed to remember. And every story, I mean, just think of them. Everybody who's remembered is remembered because they're faithful. That list in uh, Hebrews 11, they're not heroes. They are just normal people that were faithful to God. Um, Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Noah, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David, Samuel, all the prophets. If I said, what did God do for them? You could tell me. And if you didn't, you could do a quick Google search if you couldn't remember the story. The only way you wouldn't be able to tell me what God did for them is you just didn't, you forgot the story. We know what God did for them. And that is the important part of the story is that they were kind of normal people and God intervened in what he did for them and that they were faithful. They just believed that he would do what they did. But if I say, um, what did God do? What was God's story with what, uh, George Washington? I, uh, what about Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson or Hamilton? What about Neil Armstrong? What about Martin Luther King Jr. or Teddy Roosevelt or John Kennedy or Steve Jobs or Bill Gates? What did God do for them? We don't know, but we know what they did for us because it's not what your country can do for you. It's what you can do for your country. Our national collective memory is not pointed to remembering that we orbit around God and that this is his story. And he alone deserves to get the glory. And this is so important because only people who want him to have all the glory are going to live with him forever. And he will be our son. And we won't need the son anymore. But do we want that? Um, can the worship team come back up? Father, um, we just confess we are enamored by our own glory, what we can do and where we can go. Lord, we are obsessed with how you'll help us with our own agenda. Lord, I just confess, I deeply want people to know my name, and it's embarrassing. But Lord, I know that you died to put your Holy Spirit inside of me so that I could want you the way that you need to be wanted. Lord, would you grow in me a want for you? Lord Jesus, would you help us to get out of self-worship? We will never do it apart from a miracle. We need you, Lord. God, show us how imperative it is that we make you our son. You, we make you, that we just, we orbit around you, God. In Jesus' name.